Monsieur le Chancelier, Mr. Chancellor. Marshall Solins is the Charles F. Gray Distinguished Service Professor Emeritus in Anthropology at the University of Chicago. He received an AB, sorry, he received an AB from the University of Michigan in 1951, an AM from Michigan in 1952, and a PhD in Anthropology from Columbia University in 1954. After teaching at both Columbia and Michigan, he moved to the University of Chicago in 1973. Ethnographe et historien d'Océanie, Marshall Solins est mondialement reconnu. Il a été à l'avant-garde de l'anthropologie pendant plus de 60 ans, consacrant une grande partie de sa carrière à explorer la nature de la culture et la dynamique du changement historique en sondant les liens entre le présent et le passé. Above all, Marshall Solins is known for his insistence on the centrality of culture to anthropological understanding and to explanations of historical change. As he is often quoted in a saying, the notion of culture is a powerful one because we understand through it the meaningful constitution of our lives. In a word, says Professor Solins, culture is everything in its forms and transformations, its engagement in the histories of societies and the agencies of persons, culture is the distinctive object of anthropological knowledge. Professor Solins has long been committed to the well-being of indigenous peoples. His theory of culture, cultural change as the normal process of tradition formation has been invoked in support of the authenticity of indigenous traditions and oral histories and has been used to challenge attempts to delegitimize the claims of indigenous peoples to vital rights. Described as one of the sociocultural anthropology's most influential and substantively important practitioners, and as North America's most eminent and estimable living cultural anthropologist, Professor Solins to the field are recognized as, quote, nothing short of monumental. Professor Solins est auteur d'une douzaine de livres et plus de 75 articles, essais et chapitres de livres dans les domaines de l'anthropologie économique, de l'anthropologie culturelle, de la théorie culturelle, ainsi que l'histoire et de l'anthropologie historique d'Océanie. Il a été honoré par les institutions de premier plan en Grande-Bretagne, en France, en Belgique et aux États-Unis. A member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a fellow of the British Academy, and an honorary fellow of the Royal Anthropological Institute of Great Britain in Ireland, in 2011, he was named Chevalier de l'Ordre des Arts et des Lettres by the French Ministry of Culture. And in the words of Claude, of Claude Lévi-Strauss, Marshall Solins is one of the most profound and original anthropologists of our time. Monsieur le Chancelier, Mr. Chancellor, I present to you Marshall Solins that you may confer upon him the degree of Doctor of Letters, Honoris Causa. I now invite Professor Marshall Solins, McGill's most recent graduate, to deliver the convocation address. Dr. Solins. <laughs> Chancellor Megan, Principal and Vice Chancellor Fourquier, Mr. Cobbett, Chair of the Board of Governors, Dean Maioni, proud parents and guests, and above all, members of the graduating class. I am told I may speak for five or seven minutes on anything I choose. <laughs> so instead of telling you that graduation is not the end but the beginning, 
I chose cannibalism in the Fiji Islands. <laughs> it will help me explain what anthropology is all about and why I'm an honorary member of your graduation class. Paraphrasing Hillary Clinton, our graduate students used to say, it takes a village to make an anthropologist, meaning the village, usually in some exotic place, that one studied for a year or two in order to get a PhD degree. But since it takes a large international community of scholars to make a doctor honoris causa, I would acknowledge this great honor you do me by reciprocally paying homage first to my colleagues at McGill, past and present, and more generally to the achievements of the anthropological discipline that have made our work possible. In these days, when anthropology seems to have lost its focus, lurching from postmodern uncertainties to neoliberal hegemonies, McGill anthropologists, in their teaching and research, have kept the faith as custodians of, knowledge, custodians of knowledge about the greater part of human history and the planetary chroniclers of cultural diversity. More than that, the McGill Department continues a distinguished tradition of cultural analysis, begun by its founder, Richard Salisbury, continued by Bruce Trigger, and still going strong in the extraordinary comparative work of Margaret Locke, to name only the culture heroes singled out in a recent charter document of the history of the department. McGill scholars have been particularly attentive to the symbolic construction of cultural forms. I mean the way that in any given society, people and things are meaningfully defined and related which is never the only possible way. Different cultures are, in effect, alien alternate universes to which anthropologists, however, have been able to travel. Reflecting on the distinctiveness of anthropological investigations, Levi-Strauss once wrote that of all the sciences, anthropology is without doubt unique in making the most intimate subjectivity into a means of objective demonstration. What he meant was that since a culture involves a certain way that people meaningfully construct themselves and the objects of their existence, we can understand it by reproducing it as our own thought. The human scientist is not in a relation of a thinking person to a mute object of interest. Rather, anthropologists and their like are of the same intellectual nature as the peoples they study. Indeed, inasmuch as these peoples are meaningfully making their modes of life, and inasmuch as we share the same capacities of symbolic invention and understanding, we have the possibility of knowing the cultures of others in ways that are in some respects more powerful than the ways natural scientists know their physical objects. Consider that by contrast, the more the natural scientist discovers about things, say the lectern on which I'm, before which I'm standing, the less such things are like anything in human thought and, and experience. Despite appearances to the contrary, science shows that there are spaces within and between the molecules that compose it. And beyond that, at the level of quantum mechanics, our knowledge of things defies all common sense of space and time. For an elementary quantum example, we have to accept that the same object is in two different places at the same time. Niels Bohr, the physicist, is often quoted as saying that if you are not shocked by quantum physics, you don't understand it. I'm both shocked and I don't understand it. If natural science starts out with what is familiar to our experience, like the lectern, and ends with something altogether remote, human science works the other way around. One may well begin with something so distant to us as cannibalism in the Fiji Islands, 
during the 19th century, yet end up by finding it logical, which is, after all, a mental state of our own. In 1929, the British anthropologist A.M. Hocart recounted the formal speech of a Fijian chief presenting a reward to the carpenter who had built his fine canoe. The chief apologized that he could not offer the, comp the carpenter in reward a cooked man or a raw woman. For Christianity, he explained, has spoiled our feasts. The cooked man refers to an enemy cannibal victim. The raw woman would be a virgin daughter of the chief offered as a wife. One immediate anthropological question this poses is why the woman should be equi equivalent to the cannibal victim. The brief answer is that they have the same finality or function, which is the beneficial reproduction of the society. The woman directly by bearing children the cannibal victim as a sacrifice whose consumption in concert with the god procures divine benefits, notably in agriculture and human fertility. Further, given the relationship of raw women to cooked men, one can understand why in some parts of Fiji, a fine war club is a necessary betrothal gift, in effect compensating the family for the future loss of their daughter by the anticipated gain of an enemy victim. Enough said? <laughs> this cannibalism is becoming logical, and logic is something going on inside ourselves. Pardoning the pun, a custom that began as strange and remote as cannibalism in the South Seas has been assimilated and internalized, that is, as our own good sense. Since cultural practices are meaningfully constructed, and since we ourselves are symbolizing, symbolizing beings, we have the privilege of knowing others by reproducing in the operations of our own mind the very ways they are culturally organized. The method and the content of the investigation are the same in nature. The most intimate subjectivity becomes the means of an objective demonstration. If one dare paraphrase Descartes' famous proof of his existence, I think symbolically, therefore I can think them. That's how I got to be standing here in this honorable place, by thinking them. Thank you very much. <laughs>